start recording. Claudia, it's all yours. Okay, so uh, good morning or good afternoon, uh, everybody. Uh, I am Claudia Imperatore from Cone University, and uh, it's a pleasure for me to moderate this virtual event, part of the accounting design project. And I thank you, Ayunga and Steve, to invite me to be the moderator. And today is uh, like uh, Pagar uh, presented a joint paper with Daniel Benz and uh, Gavin Castar all from uh, INSEAD uh, on a very interesting topic, hedging accounting. So uh, as always, feel free to ask questions at uh, any time, uh, either raising your hands or the chat box. I will monitor both. And then it's time to give the floor to Makar and uh, good luck. <laughs> Looking forward to your presentation. Thank you, Claudia. Thank you so much. And a big thank you to Aeyong and Steve for giving me this opportunity to showcase my work along with Daniel Benz and Gavin Kassa, my mentors and co-authors on this project. Um, so we investigate whether hedge accounting complexity has an impact on the effectiveness of firms hedging activities and other outcomes. Um, so hedge accounting has been topping the list of the, being the most complex reporting areas for over two decades now. We have practitioner surveys that point out this complexity and the, the gravity of this matter. Um, just a quick heads up, a hedge accounting is a special treatment on risk management instruments that portrays their movement in sync with the underlying risk. Now we'll go into more details in a short while. But what is more interesting is that when this um, standard came about in 1998 and then was mandatorily adopted in 2000, um, since then firms have been struggling with implementing it in the right way and lots of stakeholder pushback. Has been has been registered in the hedge accounting literature, and so, and, and this particular article has been uh, included in in has been widely cited in the hedge accounting literature. And here we see that seven years down the line, um, the FASB is struggling with the most onerous requirements that hedge accounting poses. And we see the comment that this the when this stand, when this accounting treatment was first introduced by FAS 133, that particular standard has been held as a poster child of complexity and rules-based standards. Therefore, the FASB had to respond. And let's fast forward 10 years, and then we see 2017-12, in which they would like to target the target improvements to the to hedge accounting, so that hedge, hedging activities are reported in, 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 a, in, a, in a manner that is more in sync with the way hedging occurs. So the core idea behind the standard is that it would reduce the complexity in and it will simplify the application of hedge accounting. And with the passage of this standard, we, we see that popular press covers it and more and more companies are hedge accounting by the year 2020. And the standard became mandatory in the year 2019. And the academic literature catches up and also requests for researchers to, to see whether firms' decision to use hedge accounting is positive in response to the ASU. And in this paper, we kind of go a little bit further by not only just looking at whether firms are hedge accounting more, but also what type of real effects it has on firm operations, investing in financing activities. So before I go into more specifics of what the treatment is and, and how we are attacking the problem in terms of capturing its, its effects, I'd just like to take a step back and look at where the paper sits in the broader literature. So the broader literature that, that that, that we, we, we would like to invoke is the financial statement complexity literature, which has been meticulously uh, summarized in the review piece by Blankespor et al. in 2020. And here we see that mainly there are three big sources of complexity. The first is when businesses themselves or their underlying economic activities complex, that complexity feeds into the overall financial statement complexity. And then when counting rules try to map this complexity, they themselves also add to the complexity because the complexity that they introduce is probably not in sync with the complexity of underlying operations. There's something incremental that adds the complexity of financial statements um, and, and, and the reports. And the third chief source is manager, managers' discretionary disclosure choices that obfuscate the statements to an extent that um, investors and stakeholders, they are unable to derive a suitable import from the, the verbiage of, of financial reports. 
uh, because of the choices given to managers. However, in this paper particularly, uh, we're focusing on this box. And within this, we're looking at how counting standards are implemented and what complexities arise out of them. Um, I synthesize in a few bullet points some of the pressure points of implementing accounting standards as noted by standard setters, practitioners um, over time. And we see that uh, implementation complexity um, arises from um, strong data requirements that are, are cumbersome for management. The accounting treatments have serious restrictions on them such that even vanilla transactions sometimes cannot be captured uh, because of these uh, restrictions on, 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 on various accounting treatments because they require certain prerequisite criteria to be met. And as a result, they need to be monitored on, on a very transaction by transaction basis. Even when all this is done and you have the controls in place to, to implement standards, um, ex post, you want um, um, footnotes which will describe the entire process and those requirements can also be cumbersome. And then you need to submit these things at different points. And mind you, when you implement standards, there are also intermittent deadlines within them, uh, which relate to specific transactions and economic events that need to be captured. And to add, add more to it, if you're a consolidated entity, there are gap conversions involved. And these things have been highlighted in practitioner literature. And we try to look at hedge accounting uh, in view of these complications because all of these apply to hedge accounting. <laughs> uh, a little bit more on the background. So in 2014, FASB started the simplification project with particular standards in mind, which were revenue recognition, financial instruments, pensions, taxation. And in the inaugural speech, the, the then chairman, Russell Golden, um, discusses the pressure points and kind of makes certain comments and I have kind of extracted some of, some of the comments which are really um, worth reading and that tie into the query that we do in this paper. Here we see that they recognize that preparers suffer from headaches and uh, while preparing information uh, by complying with the gap rules, the output produced is not very meaningful. But if you see the last two comments, here we, we, we see that the information that is being produced um, might be useful and then the cost of producing it is where the tension is. So there is a certain trade-off that standard setters face um, in, in finalizing standards or finalizing gap that would kind of fit in with capturing economic events. Um, while there is utility in the information that is produced once compliance happens, the compliance itself is costly. So where do we stand? And the next natural question is, what does the academic literature say about this trade-off and overall burdens that, that are faced by preparers. So in, in synthesizing the academic view, the short answer sorry, to this question is that the academic literature does not explicitly um, discuss the trade-off, but there are sort of um, papers and the literature has evolved in a way that, that complexity specifically arising from reporting standards can be understood in, in the following way. And we kind of capture it using this inverted U parabola in which there is a section or there is some complexity that is useful um, for contracting, for informational purposes, but then later on, there is diminishing returns that kick in because of excessiveness in the cost of compliance. And just to add more structure to it, so I start with the information advantages, and we know from extensive capital market literature that when information asymmetry is high, um, information produced by disclosures helps reduce the cost of capital. So um, the level of complexity is matched with the level of complexity in the underlying economics is, is kind of useful because it helps stakeholders make useful decisions. And here, if we take it step forward, this reduction in information asymmetry is useful for investing in financing, removing the frictions that relate to investing in financing activities um, at firms. Then, the extensive real effects literature also points to the monitoring and contracting benefits associated with disclosures. And to the extent that these complex rules, they produce disclosures that help regulate underlying economic activity, they, such complexity can be useful for businesses. Now, uh, please note that I underline the word disclosures because um, in the prior literature, there is no explicit link with complexity of rules and these effects. They have been largely been studied in the context of compliance costs. 
and which is these compliance costs when they become dead weight or excessive that they have a negative effect on the advantages that can arise from complicated accounting rules. And just a quick overview of what we know with with regards to specific with, with regards to evidence specific to accounting rules complexity. Um, we see that these rules they can lead to regulatory overload such that firms have to invest um, in accounting expertise on their boards by taking on qualified accountants and uh, coming up with sort of systems in place that would address this complexity. We also see that there is restatement risk and the risk of audit failure, which uh, results when, when, when firms are unable to comply properly because of complexity in the rules that require a certain considerations, which I early alluded on um, the beginning of the presentation. And then most pro yes, sir, young. Yeah, do you want to finish? You can, you can finish. Uh, I just wanted to, yeah, yeah, yeah. I just yeah, yeah. Uh, wanted I to close by saying that um, one of the most pressing issues is the investor disclosure processing costs that emanate from complex rules. And that feeds into the 10K complexity, which again adds to these costs of compliance. And one last sort of um, aspect of, of cost is that because we're giving complexity into the market, we have to kind of balance it out by giving uh, voluntary disclosures, which we wouldn't have if complex rules were not complied with. Yes, Ayun. Yeah, I was hoping that later in your talk, maybe you can give us an, uh, an example of something related to this new hedge accounting standards complexity example because what mm -hmm. i have in mind is that when we when i look at your graph at least there are two sources of complexity mm -hmm. uh came to my mind one is uh there's a heterogeneous transactions across firms mm -hmm. or within the firm across contracts mm -hmm. so the reason we have a very complex rule is to actually accommodate there are different situations. So mm -hmm. the complex rules, for example, the previous revenue recognition guidance will be uh, under situation A, you will use the measurement <laughs> type A, and then they try to kind of come up with different scenarios to accommodate different situations. That is one source of a complexity. The other source of a complexity will be everyone use one unified homogeneous rule, mm -hmm. but we have 100 steps instead of 10 steps. So. I don't know uh, whether you distinguish these two different kinds of complexities and then how does that relate to the usefulness and all the different mm -hmm. outcome variables you have. Yeah. So I was yeah. hoping that maybe later you have a more specific yeah. example related to this particular standard. Uh, yeah. Because it yeah. seems that the literature talk about many different things under yeah. the umbrella, yeah. umbrella of uh, complexity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah no. Point well taken. I um, I will branch into hedge accounting complexity very soon. I just want, because I will use the same framework in, in analyzing those particular complicated rules, I just want to lay the background because all of these discussions relate to the hedge accounting complexity and the outcome variables, but thank you. So the dead weight cost of compliance, they- Also a question actually coming from the chat. So Lipka is asking, uh, don't regulators prefer more complexity? <laughs> um, probably the, uh, the accounting firms prefer complexity so that they make money out of them, but regulators on the face of it, as, as I was just having, oops, sorry, I was just discussing here, they, they seem to side with the preparers and say, we want to get rid of all the clutter in, in, the, in the accounting standards. But they do point out that there is something useful in them, but they are very careful, at least from my reading of what the regulators have been pointing out when they started the simplification project. Um, yeah. Did that answer your question, Zipta, or? So I was thinking about the more general question of rules versus principles, right? So, yeah. I mean, complexity is just an extreme form of rules, mm -hmm. if you think about that. And so we've had the debate about rules versus principles a long time. And, you know, so one of the reasons we say that uh, the U.S. has more rules, they say litigation risk and so on, mm -hmm. right? And um, I don't know if that's the answer, but it seems like you can cast this in a sort of broader framework of rules or principles and then sort of mm -hmm. ask, okay, so how much does complexity move the needle in that discussion? Yeah, yeah. Agreed, agreed. Thank you. Yes, Steve. Uh, 
I've always said the question of whether the complexity has to do with the repairs or the complexity of those who read the financial statements. Um, I think there's a distinction we do it. A lot of complaints have come from uh, preparers, okay? Uh, but a lot of the, the, the complexity is on the part of the readers. Like every time I have to deal with uh, with 133, uh, there are a lot of accounting issues I can just walk into class and talk about, but I have to go back and really think it through and follow it through. It's quite complex as, a, as an analyst, okay? And those two things are, I think need to be distinguished. Where are you falling on that? We're falling on the preparer and mm. we're motivating ourselves from the other users as well, but uh, we're looking at preparer costs, preparer burdens, and how complying with financial reporting rules is burdensome for preparers. So there is literature that looks at other stakeholders and um, I will discuss some of that in this context as well, but uh, we're looking at how managers deal with the complex complexity they face when they comply with standards. So just coming, just closing on, on, on this discussion here, um, prior literature says that we do not know how disclosure processing costs, they have real effects. So since the literature also points to complexity of reporting rules as a major contributor to disclosure processing costs, we kind of look at it as, um, as a gap in the literature to see whether there are real effects associated with, with, with compliance burden and complexity of financial reporting rules. And then in, in, the, in the piece uh, by Roy Chaudhry, Shroff and Birdie, we see that the financial reporting quality feeds into investing activity, but they do not cite any papers that will look at complexity of rules and how that affects financial reporting. So I think these are important questions. And then following on from these, we asked the broad question as to whether do reporting rules, the complexity of reporting rules affect underlying business activity at a very broad level. But then yes, moving on to the laboratory, what we're actually doing in the paper, it's very specific to hedge accounting and hedge accounting complexity. So applied to the setting, we translate this broad economic question into whether hedge accounting complexity influences the effectiveness of firms hedging activities. And why this question is important, there are three reasons that I will cite. The first is, which I already alluded to that, it is a complicated area of accounting, which, which has been considered the most complex, but what is more important is that it, is, it, it causes misalignment with actual risk management. And actual risk management is, 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 is practiced across board internationally by large companies, and, um, and they, head, they head using financial derivatives on a daily, monthly, and weekly basis using these instruments that protect the values of revenues, costs, assets, and liabilities. And a plethora of effective, uh, sorry, a plethora of accounting and finance literature points to the benefits associated with effective hedging and the way it curtails um, investing and financing frictions. The second important point is that there has been a lot of regulatory debate and academic scrutiny associated with hedge accounting, and it is still unresolved, although there has been a major, major sort of uh, revamp of the rules. There is a lot of criticism on those rules as well. So um, it, it kind of points out to a very long, long, long winded debate that has been ongoing ever since 1998 when hedge accounting was first introduced. Yes, Eva. Hey, Waka. Uh, yeah, pretty feel free to defer your answer to this question. You may have a slide for this because I'm just wondering, like, you know, when it comes to HEDSI, uh, I can think of like financial institutions, like, you know, banking, the insurance companies are the most affected one, but I'm not so sure about like how big of deal is uh, this HEDSI accounting for the, for just, you know, the manufacturing or like service type of companies. So maybe, you know, give yeah. us some sort of like the big picture, how big, I mean, economically, it is that would be uh, very useful in the beginning. Yeah, you're right that the, the financial sector is a big consumer of SFAS-133 and ongoing standards, but the non-financial sector has also been using derivatives, and perhaps that is where the problem lies, according to us, because with the financial sector, we know that they have incentives to, to arbitrage and to engage in derivatives for speculative reasons. But for the non-financial firms, which are not speculating, hedge accounting was for them. And as I will just go through a, very quickly the timeline of standards, um, hedge accounting came about for these non-financial firms because they are not engaging in derivatives as points of investment to make short-term gains or arbitrage on their positions. So hedge accounting kind of understands that you're not arbitraging, therefore, whatever fair value movements we want you to do, you shouldn't be doing them the way you would do if you were an asset manager. So 
for the asset manager, perhaps hedge accounting does not apply too much because they have, and for them, the rules were made very complicated. And at, at the same time, the non-financial firms got hit by that. And, and this quote that the, the Fortune Global 500 companies, 90% of them use, and they are not all of them are banking companies, majority of them are manufacturing companies. Um, I hope that answered your question. Yeah, thanks for your answer. But I'm just curious, like, it would be great, like, you know, what proportion of their, you know, yeah. like, asset would be related to hedging and then how much, she, you know, like heads like they should care because like if you know if it's like very small portion like it, it's it, it yes they have it but like it doesn't really affect their main business like in in a significant way then like should we concerned about this non financial institution at all or mm -hmm. still you know given the small benefit of this you know the cost of, of doing this is like too much so that's where we want to care about like so so sort of like you know it's kind of like uh you know this question about like the economic magnitude of mm -hmm. this issue for this non-financial company would be mm -hmm. i think useful that was my yeah uh question yeah. i think i need to do more work on that to get this, the relevant statistics on the the magnitude that is being to what magnitude they are being affected but i i, I make a note of that yes jeremy yeah, I have a question on sort of the interpretation that you're making. You keep motivating things around complexity mm -hmm. and you, you know, you said a lot of that. Mm -hmm. um, but in, in your introduction, it's, you know, let me read this sentence. It says that the purpose of SFAS 133 was to better reflect a firm's derivative activity mm -hmm. in financial statements by focusing on the intended use of the derivatives, right? So that's was the purpose originally. And then you switch to, but it was too complex. But if we give another framing to um, the revised standards, we could say the original one didn't meet the purpose of, of focusing yeah. on the intended use of the derivatives. Yeah. The new one does a better job of meeting those intended purposes. And yeah. then it's yeah. then it, the reason that they would change is because the accounting didn't reflect the underlying business purposes very well, according to the um, what you're calling the more complex standards. And with the revised standards, mm -hmm. now it fits their business better, so they can use it more. Does that? I, how do yeah, you distinguish yeah. between those explanations? So I have I have a full blown example in which I distinguish between the two accounting treatments, and and point out where the complexity is. It is because of the complexity that the accounting is not reflected properly. So um, if you let me defer to the example, the short answer to your question is that the misalignment in treatments is because of complex rules. So, so this is where I think your pitch is, is um, falling short for me, is you're really saying that it's the misalignment that is the problem, but the complexity in this case happens to cause the misalignment. And so it's all about misalignment with the underlying business purposes. It's not anything to do with complexity in and of itself is a problem. It's that when complexity applies in a way that it's not, um, doesn't when accounting rules business. When accounting rules become complex and are not given a proper sort of implementation, that complexity part leads to the, the, accounting, the, the economic transaction not being showed in the right way. This is the main issue. Right. Um, so you're again, you're saying it's not alignment that's the problem because you could <laughs> manufacture some standards that were yeah, extremely yeah. complex that yeah, yeah. fit the standard that fit things really well. Right. So, for example, if if there were tons and tons of exceptions for this case, you do this for this case, you do this. And there are like a million of those that would be super complex, mm -hmm. but might do a really good job of alignment. And so to me, I think um the point you're doing is you're linking complexity must be misalignment but i don't think that's necessary right, right, right. i think you have a case where complexity and misalignment went together yeah and yeah. and that's interesting right if that <clears throat> is generally the case then then we care about complexity yeah. Yeah. overall but if it's not generally the case then we care about complexity being applied incorrectly right understood i, I would just think that would help me yeah. in in the pitch of the paper to make clear that it's not complexity in and of itself that's the problem necessarily, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Understood. 
I'm going to take that as a note um, and, 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 and defer to, to you again when I go through the example, and then we can probably get more opinion from you. Yeah, thanks. So the third is that so far complexity in, in the accounting literature has been looked at using word counts, document lengths. And this particular rule provides actionable compliance reliefs that reduce complexity. So it gives us a chance to instrument complexity in a more substantive manner through the ASU 2017-12. <clears throat> so uh, before going into the nitty let me show you what we find. In terms of actual hedging and uh, in terms of accounting and actual hedging effects, when the ASU reduces hedge accounting complexity, hedge accounting usage increases between 15 to 30%, and actual derivative usage is 1.6 times greater for the treatment group. When hedge accounting complexity reduces, it also reflects in a reduction in economic risk exposures with about 5% reductions across various risk exposures, including overall firm risk, interest rate risk, FX risk, and, and in some tests, commodity risk exposures. And we see that also in reductions in cash flow volatility and earnings volatility. And in the final set of results, we have that the same complexity results in greater debt financing, greater investment and reduction in bid-ask spread, ensuing from the earlier effects that, that I just showed. With these in mind, I will next move on to a little bit more institutional details and an example of hedge accounting being applied to a context in which, and then kind of linking how complexity arises. So here we see that the broadly the, the financial instruments or derivatives reporting has is divided in two broad errors. There is an off balance sheet error, and then there is an on balance sheet error. By off balance sheet, the derivative values were simply footnoted. And we have two standards here that footnote simply the nominal value, and then later on require also the fair value to be footnoted in, 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 in the disclosures without impacting the balance sheet. And then 1998, we have the SFAS 133 that kind of changed everything, got rid of all requirements and instilled this fair value through profit and loss requirement on firms. And then keeping in mind that this is something that is more relevant to those that are engaging in derivatives for trading, it gives a, an option to do hedge accounting for people that are not speculatively using derivatives. And that comes with a huge caveat that there are still very complicated requirements that need to be fulfilled and lengthy documentation that needs to be maintained before the firm becomes eligible for hedge accounting. Lots of hue and cry. There's a lot of academic evidence around SFAS, SFAS, SFAS 133, and it is still unresolved as to whether it helped mitigate risk and, and promote proper risk management on part of firms. A clarification standard comes out in 2009 in which they would like the tabular disclosures of derivative positions in terms of whether given or not given hedge accounting, and also risk-wise. And this is really useful for us because we go into these reports and collect hand collect data on quarterly derivative usage as treatment variable. And then we have the final standard that is the focus of this paper in which the standard set to say they simplify the application of hedge accounting, which was previously very cumbersome. Um, just a little bit of uh, note here that these red box standards are recognition standards. They are not disclosure standards, so to speak. They, they keep the disclosures aside and they just change the way the accounting is done by removing requirements. Yes, Ian. I, I'm just curious, like after 133, um, we are not able to see the nominal amount or uh, for derivative contracts, right? Related to CWAS earlier point, mm -hmm. to calculate materiality threshold, we probably need the contracts nominal amount and then somehow use that to kind of like compare to the total assets to see how much derivatives uh, instruments actually a company has used. Is that right? Yeah. Like after 1998? They, they are they doing that. They're not just not disclosing them. They would so have they, to there's no disclosure. Okay. There's no, they, they get rid of SFS 105 and 107. There, there, are, there are requirements to maintain records and then fair value these things on the balance sheet. But in terms of footnoted tabular disclosures that breaks down the derivatives into risk and into treatment type, that was not as part of the 133. And 161, along with other smaller standards that clarified 
these disclosures came out. So like after 1998, external users no longer have that information about what's the total amount of derivatives uh, each company has. They have the fair values engaged. only on the balance sheet. Only the fair value. Okay, yes, thank yes. you. So just, just quickly introduce finally what hedge accounting is. It's a voluntary treatment that portrays risk management using derivatives by, by, by noting that derivatives, if fair valued ordinarily on the, in the income statement is not in sync with risk management, it is in sync with arbitrage or trading on derivatives. And then under hedge accounting, this derivative fair valuing is matched with the value of the associated risk um, in, in three different ways. Um, in cash flow hedge, there is a future receipt or payment that needs to be hedged. In the fair value hedge, there's an asset or liability whose economic value is to be hedged, not the book value. And in that investment hedge, you have a foreign operation or subsidiary that needs to be hedged in terms of its foreign currency movement. The first and the third follow the same treatment under hedge accounting. Simply put, you defer the unrealized gains and losses in, in equity until the transaction hits the accounts. And in the second, you keep the derivative movement and you bring in the associated asset or liability into the income statement exceptionally by overriding its own standard. I will focus on the first category because 80% of hedge accounting happens in the cash flow hedge space. So just to give you a quick example of how this works in the airline industry that heavily consumes derivatives on fuel. So let's see that the airline has a fuel requirement at the end of quarter four of 100,000 worth of fuel, which it wants to hedge at the 100 using kerosene futures. And these kerosene futures will be locking the price so they, they can do the future sort of um, planning and budgeting. And the spot price of these futures is fluctuating. And as a result, this derivative fluctuates and that adjustment has to be put through the income statement which misrepresents everything as trading as if the airline is trading and having speculative positions on derivatives when it is not, it is intending to support operations at the end of quarter four. The cash flow and the earnings effect happen at the end of quarter four, and this is clearly a non-speculative intent, as a result of which we see that if we were, we were to go with the normal baseline method of non-hedge accounting, we would see that to curtail an exposure of 16, which is the standard deviation of of the derivative of, of the underlying price, the earnings volatility introduced in the income statement is 30, which is purely accounting, and that misrepresents as trading. So to curtail an exposure, you are introducing an accounting volatility of 30, which creates reporting misincentives on part of firms, such that it, it makes hedging difficult for them. And, and this sort of effect is magnified when there is sort of profuse airline activity going on throughout the quarters, throughout the years on a daily, on a daily basis. And hedge accounting kind of comes in and kind of removes this fair value adjustment from the income statement, puts it into OCI under cash flow hedging, and releases it when the, the position in the future is closed and the actual kerosene is purchased. Now, this is the baseline treatment without going into a lot of nitty gritty, but what is complex in this? So under SFAS 133, I will just summarize a little bit on a, at a very high level what the complexity. The first is the, the item that is being, being hedged, it, it, there are restrictions on certain components of it. For example, if the kerosene future were not available and you had crude oil futures, you would not be able to hedge this. Uh, hedge account, you will be able to hedge, but you will not be able to apply hedge accounting. And more generally, this would be, for example, the rubber component in an overall wheel or maize component in animal feed, et cetera. So these are component restrictions is, is, is basically what firms are doing. And you put restrictions on them so that they cannot apply hedge accounting on, on valid transactions. The most cumbersome of all, at every reporting period, the movement between the derivative and the underlying hedged item has to be retrospectively and prospectively assessed using regression or correlation analyses that show that the movements lie between 80 to 125% and anything beyond or at the thresholds will, will make hedge accounting invalid, such that you have to restate everything for that period and stop using hedge accounting. That is considered the most cumbersome requirement because this has to be performed on a derivative basis. Then what? even if you fulfill that criteria, whatever is beyond that 100% movement 
that has to be separately monitored and put back into the income statement as hedge ineffectiveness. And before everything happens, probably I should have put this as at first, a lot of documentation has to be put in place with the intended derivative strategy, the time periods involved, the type of derivatives involved, and these things are unknown, say six months before. And, and this, if this documentation is not complete or is not in place, hedge accounting cannot be applied. All these restrictions is, is, is adding to the complexity and compliance burden of, of being able to do hedge accounting, uh, given that you have valid sort of hedging strategies already in place. So what happens in the aftermath of, of this compliance burden, we see that the practice responds by saying that you are making accounting risk and volatility a bigger problem than real risk. Uh, there is too much of um, an administrative arm required to, co to comply with all the complicated bookkeeping, such that there is a labyrinth of processes and documentation because it has to be maintained at the derivative or security level and creates perverse incentives to hedge, such that it culminates into this comment, which I started my presentation with. And to match this with the academic views, we see that survey and empirical evidences on SFAS 133 kind of tell us that underlying economic hedging practices were adversely affected, and it caused informational problems for investors and mispricing by analysts. Significant shareholder value, well, when, when, the, when the SFAS standard was first introduced, and there are mixed findings on whether this disciplined or did not discipline the, the users of hedge accounting. And this is uh, more or less in the non-financial um, space where with the non-financial, we're not looking at sort of, especially in the earnings volatility or the hedging activity, we're looking at non-financial firms um, away from the asset managers. So after a long um, decade of comment letter and 80 stakeholder meeting exchanges, we see that we finally come up with a solution according to the FASB, where they say that we will give you more time so you don't have to prepare everything on spot beforehand and delay that until the first quarter. You're eligible to component hedge. You're also eligible to hedge using privately negotiated interest rates such as SIFMA and not just LIBOR and various other financial instruments, which I have skipped and in my, in my example. And, and you can replace quantitative assessments with qualitative assessments. And there are a lot of relaxations that you can have at the first date when you do the first quantitative assessment. And it also eliminates the hedge ineffectiveness, the deltas that you have to single out. So given this perspective in mind, let's get back to our framework that I introduced first. How does this pan out into, into, into how the reduction in complexity will result or not result in the intended outcomes that we hypothesize? Focusing on the case of compliance costs. Yes, Jeremy. Just one more follow up on my earlier thought. Yeah. All of the examples that you give sound like not complexity, but difficulty in qualifying for hedge accounting. It's mm -hmm. not it's not that it's too complex for them to do. It's that it's hard to meet the qualifications mm -hmm. that will allow them to do hedge accounting. Mm -hmm. And therefore, mm -hmm. all that the the new standards do is make it easier to qualify. They don't make the standards themselves like the it's not more more or less complex, right? You're talking about um, a spreadsheet that someone has to do that once it's set up, it's not all that difficult to do. So it's <laughs> I'm, gonna, the... I'm gonna interject here a little bit. Um, I was a hedge accounting advisor at PwC for several years and one effectiveness test, even if the spreadsheet is set up, takes several weeks. <laughs> Okay, it may take, uh, my point is that the incremental cost is not the complexity issue. It's the, you, it's the maybe compliance cost or, com, or ability to, um, to qualify, not that it's difficult. Mm -hmm. I mean, we all know that it's not super easy to understand if we've taught these standards, right? It's not simple to teach anyway, but, <laughs> but, but the underlying issue that it sounds like you're talking about is ability to qualify. Yeah, which yeah. sounds different than complexity, right? If, if when we generally talk about complexity in like very general terms, it's like, that's too hard to understand. And yeah. it seems appealing because teaching hedge accounting and all of the getting people up to speed on using it was very difficult to, you know, like getting through all of that. Yeah. But 
the underlying, once you understand it, the underlying issues are not that complex. And yeah, so yeah. to me, the, <clears throat> I'm just trying to think about the pitch of the paper. What can we actually take away from it? And I think we can take away that how it was implemented caused problems and the change makes it easier to, mm -hmm. makes it more effective, right? So that's great. Yeah. I think just the impl just the inferences, can we then say any time that um, the FASB wants to put in place something that's complex, we should object to it? Mm -hmm. Or is it that the com if the compliance cost or the ability to qualify are really high, is that the problem? Right. I, I'm just trying to take away like what the what the practical application of this, mm -hmm. what we should learn from this should be. And to me, it's not clear that it's be afraid of complex standards. Jer Jeremy, at the time, I remember 133 after that, one of the big things was they just putting in trap of, uh, I saw it as complex, that falling in the trap of actually applying hedge accounting when you shouldn't apply hedge accounting. And I weren't quite clear about it. They were, they were really worried about that. I, I went to forums on uh, where you know, CFOs and controls were talking about. That was their big fear. So I'd see that as complexity. Uh, I just, you know, I, don't, I have a fear that I'm doing the wrong thing because it's, it's, it's complex. I don't quite understand what's, 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 uh, what's required here. I can fall into a trap. Right. I, and I, so I'm, I'm with you on this idea. The problem is, um, can we attribute the change to now it's less complex? Well, other things were happening at the time where they already had to learn how to apply these things, right? So it's not, it's not like this change suddenly makes everyone understand it better is my, my sort of question about the inferences that you can make here. It's, I, I would say it's possible that could be happening. Um, and of course the history, like as Stephen pointed out, that's, there is that involved in all of this, but I, I, I would just like, I think you'll have more impact if you can think carefully about what, what we should prescribe then for, for example, the FASB, right? If, if for example, they, everyone knew how to apply it, like they did at in not like they do now, but we started back then with the same thing. Would the complexity be the argument anymore, or would the compliance be the argument? And so, <laughs> to yeah. me, I, I think the 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 standard setting implications matter because people will draw implications from your study about what we should be doing. So, sorry, I'm sorry if it sounds like I'm being adversarial. I mean. I, I yeah. think it's going to be effective. It's can we be careful about how we talk yeah. about it as all? Yeah. I, I, I understand your point. I get what you're saying. Um, it's just that standard setters themselves are also kind of considering um, complexity to be synonymous to compliance burden. How, whether to disentangle the two kind of um, in terms of semantics, um, I'm, I'm not sure how to pitch the paper in terms of uh, not being complex, but being burdensome in terms of compliance. Um, is that what you'd like to see that call it compliance burden instead? Yeah, I think compliance mm -hmm. cost versus complexity we understand, right? And and probably both were involved, but the implications are different between the two, I think. Right. Okay. Thank or you. I guess the other one just to say is complexity necessarily higher compliance cost? I think that's the assumption you mm -hmm. have under here. If it's more complex, the mm -hmm. compliance costs are necessarily higher. And if you, maybe if you just lay that out early, carefully, that would help. Understood. Uh, you have a comment from Sugipta in, in the chat. And also, if you want to ask, make, make your comment, if you want. And you have a 15 minutes left, OK, just to. So yeah, so it's just that to sort of, there, there were a lot of issues in interpreting and implementing FAS 133, as we all know, you know, the big four all set up these manuals that are hundreds of pages long on how to implement uh, FAS 133. And there was even a derivatives implementation group or DIG that was set up to deal with sort of the interpretation and implementation issues by the FASB. And they met almost weekly for two years. So it was a very difficult standard now, what they call that compliance or complexity, I don't know, but I do know that there was a lot of effort put into 
figuring out how to actually apply it in all of these use cases and how to decide when things fell into one side or the other. Yeah. It's also interesting how the standard yeah. setters call it complex standard as well and use the same sort of wording in the ASU, we reduce complexity and there is a strong compliance burden element to it, but, but point well taken that complexity is, is a bigger thing and compliance burden is, is a major part of it. Yes, I am. Yeah, so like every time I listen to your hatch accounting paper, I learn something new. So today what I learned is the differential abilities or how easy to kind of like qualify for hatch accounting. So yeah. this kind of one follow-up thought is that it sounds like you talk about this 85%, right? There's a kind of like a threshold if the effectiveness uh, or the correlation between the hatch position and also the intended hatched uh, position and then the derivative positions are not highly correlated, then they cannot be qualified. Mm -hmm. So as an archival researcher, can you go back to different derivative markets like uh, commodity, different commodity markets or fixed income and then to look at their volatilities? And yeah. you should be able to predict that during the high volatility period for a particular market, very few firms are able to qualify yeah. Uh, yeah. for hedge accounting. Yeah. And uh, do you see that actually disappear in terms of the usage of hedge accounting in particular market pre-post? Yeah. And that yeah. would be a nice way to mm -hmm. test this separate channel, maybe overlap or not overlap with complexity, but we know that they just not able to uh, qualify for hedge accounting during the pre-period, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that would be kind of like, yeah. Decompose your current. Yeah. yeah. I think there are some papers that look at derivative shocks in the finance literature that look at restricting the availability of derivatives that causes hedge ineffectiveness, what you're pointing out. And that is yeah. that that is also supported by practice that you know this reduces the ability to hedge whenever there's volatility in the derivatives market or financial instruments are unavailable. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank yeah. you. So just carrying on with the with the discussion on on complex on these ASU reliefs, they should increase hedge accounting use and increase hedging ability, as also pointed out by the finance literature. Whenever new finan financial instruments become available, that increases increases the hedging ability. And we see theoretical and commentary literature which points to fa the fair value disincentives created in absence of hedge accounting that should point towards an increase in hedge accounting use when compliance burden or complexity reduces. But at the same time, we have a lot of criticism on this new standard, which says reducing the, 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 the sort of standard from a 500 something page to a 400 page standard is not enough. Um, and, and the requirements are still cumbersome. Uh, you take the major parts away, but you don't take a lot of nitty gritty weedy details used to retain those. And there's a lot of auditors for scrutiny. They will not always just uh, leave firms away with, 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 with not doing quantitative tests, they might just ask them voluntarily. And there has been reports of internal control disruptions when implementing the new standards because of changing systems that although would not require those reports, but would require rearrangement. And we have concurrent burdens that are effective in the same period as this standard comes out. So when these concurrent burdens come in, what is the scope of this ASU in meeting the intended hedge accounting and hedging outcomes that we hypothesize. So I state the first hypothesis in null form that firms do not increase the use of hedge accounting and derivatives when the ASU reduces complexity or compliance burden. Next, I look at risk exposure from reduced complexity. And here I invoke the first two boxes. Um, in view of reduction in complexity and compliance burden, we see that there is hedging potential, hedge accounting ability, but will this additional hedging be effective? And we see that critics have already looked empirically and the practice has already informed that there is loss of risk relevant information for preparers and investors when those quantitative tests are not done. And according to some, those quantitative tests provide risk relevant information for investors. And they also provide certain managerial discipline, discipline that could be taken away when you're not monitoring derivatives properly as you would. By, uh, by conducting those quantitative tests and reporting ineffectiveness at that granular level. So at the end, if you take that away, they might end up using derivatives speculatively or inappropriately such that overall hedging while hedging ability and use of derivatives might increase. It might not be effective at the end of the day because overall exposures might not change or they might increase. Yes, Reluca. 
Hi. So I I was wondering if you're predicting that the hedge accounting will increase. Is it because firms are now taking, because firms are had uh, derivatives that were not designated, they are now they are willing to de they or they are able to designate, or is it because they are now going into derivatives, they're getting more derivatives, they're more willing to uh, to invest in derivatives because of this of this standard. So the standard is giving certain, yeah, the standard is giving reporting relief. And we have precedents in the literature that says fair value reporting is an impediment towards hedge accounting because it does not reflect what you're actually doing in terms of financial risk management. So when right, you are but allowed, I'm saying is it just that they have these derivatives that were not designated and now they can designate or is it now they can go into you know invest in new kinds of derivatives and and they have more yeah. options because of the hedge accounting standard so because the cost of hedging has reduced you would expect hedging to increase the compliance cost is reduced it is less expensive for you to do hedging you will increase hedging that's like the basic sort of argument but that's why I'm saying, but why does it increase? Does it increase because we have, we're willing to invest in new derivatives. We can, there's uh, new new instruments that can qualify for hedge accounting. Yeah. Or yeah. is it because those old derivatives that we were using now suddenly qualify? It's because you remove the fair value mis disincentive. The fair value can now be shifted away until you liquidate the underlying asset, which is hedged. So that the fair value reporting incentive is created as a result of the ASU. Right, so we have this incentive, but I'm asking that, like, do we do, do you think that firms actually invest in new derivatives or is it that the derivatives that they usually use are suddenly qualified both, for hedge both, accounting? Both, both, both. Because I show in the test that derivative usage increases. So the existing use derivatives will be given incrementally the hedge accounting treatment and it will also induce new derivative usage. But uh, so, I was just looking, I, I, I heard you say that before, but in table three, actually derivative use, am I misinterpreting this? It's It looks like derivative use is actually decreasing after the adoption of the standard. Um, you're it's looking decreasing at less for, for firms that, hedge, that use hedge accounting, but still mm -hmm. decreasing overall, right? Yeah, yeah. In, in descriptives and the means are decreasing, but the median is increasing. And when I do proper multivariate tests, I see an increase for the treatment firms. Isn't table three the multivariate test? Uh, Raga, maybe, you know, as a, there are five minutes left, uh, it might be good if you, maybe you can try. Um, let me just quickly go I can, to, um, Relika, we can, we can defer this um, once yes. the recorded session finishes. So the, the final set of hypotheses kind of says that investing friction should reduce according to the hypothesis already developed, but there are other three um, reasons why the informational environment will change, which will also reduce the financing frictions. And here, with the usual caveats in place, I hypothesize that there will be no change in bid ask spreads, external financing and investments. Um, I'm just going to move forward very quickly just to highlight some of the main results. Um, so we see that the hedge accounting as hand collected using quarterly derivative fair values, we see an upward trend immediately after the issuance of the 2007-12. A little bit about the research design that we use about five techniques to circumvent endogeneity. The biggest one being designated use that orthogonalizes the, the binary treatment between a hedge accounting user and non-hedge accounting user, um, and, and some tests that would address whether it is really the increase in hedge accounting use post ASU resulting in reduced risk exposures and bringing external financing and investing spillovers. So this is, I'm not sure if this is table three, but here we kind of, I'm just sorry about the, the crowded table here, but this is where we see, we try to control for as many things as possible to see whether the ASU did increase hedge accounting and derivative use. And if you are a hedge accounting user, you would see an increase in derivative use in the, first, in, in the last column. And then the first two columns kind of support the notion that hedge accounting itself was, was, was used more. Um, and here are tests on risk exposures. And we see that the, the quarterly implementations of hedge accounting um, result in reductions in risk exposures um, across firm risk and three exposures of interest rate, commodity prices, and FX risk. The commodity price is not showing, is not loading up in this one, but we find support of that in the new users. 
Following on to performance volatilities, there we see the real effect showing in cash flow volatilities that reduce as a result of increased hedging um, when the ASU is implemented and the earnings volatility also follows. Finally, the financial outcomes. Here we can see that debt and debt financing and investments, they increase and bid ask spread fall as a result of, um, of hedge accounting. I, I couldn't go through the bid ask spread hypotheses properly, but uh, there is evidence in theory that says that hedge accounting cleans out the production in the sense that it separates hedging profits from production profits. So there are information advantages associated with increased hedge accounting use. Um, just to focus in on the compliance cost issue, we separate out the, the, uh, the, the sample into uh, less profitable and more profitable firms in the pre-ASU period. And we see that those that are less profitable, they suffer more from SGNA expenses, which are, are, are going into the treasury departments. And there, the, the effects are more pronounced. And then just to corroborate further, we see there are 74 firms that newly adopt hedge accounting after the ASU and the effects can be seen in them, although the financial effects are in the right direction, but they're not significant. And this is just another robustness test. I think uh, it's a good point for me to conclude. I'm gonna skip this one and just look at the contributions. We contribute to several streams of literature, the hedging and hedge accounting literature uh, specifically and the accounting complexity and disclosure processing cost literature and the real effects literature and assist standard setters in doing sort of a post implementation review of whether the standard was successful or not. However, I would like to conclude by, by saying that although the ASU did improve hedging and hedge accounting outcomes and market and financing outcomes for firms, the, the results need to be taken with caution when it comes to other areas because they differ in stakeholder monitoring and compliance costs, especially in, in, in areas where, where stakeholder monitoring is higher than in the case of hedge accounting, this might not be the case. And since we are going into ESG standardization, what do these results speak of the debate between complexity and compliance burdens, providing certain benefits and also providing um, additional compliance costs? So where do we draw the line? With this, I conclude my presentation by reminding you of the next event, which is on the 13th of December um, on debt contracting and positive theory implications of financial reporting. Thank you, Bakar. Perfect so on much. time, actually, you know, a good job. Actually, we have like 30 seconds for a last question, maybe, before like closing the meeting. I'm, I'm happy to stay longer and just